Hello, I'm Ishka, and uh, this channel is Tales and Renaissance, where we will be talking about arts and culture, and hopefully the most Renaissance man like man with arts and culture may be discussed, so uh, please stay tuned for that. Now, uh, I have thought about doing this video for quite a while, but uh, just didn't get to it uh, before now. But uh, I'll probably title it something like uh, why Betty Davis cannot be the main character in All About Eve. Now, I don't particularly wish to discuss the movie All About Eve to any higher kind of extent. Uh, I just think that um, uh, the better conversation to be had uh, is about some of the intellectual properties of classical dramaturgy and how it is that this kind of uh, architecture to what's supposed to be classically competent storytelling why it's sort of getting lost in the flood when people just have kind of a sloppy half dismissive attitude towards this particular convention and, uh, you know, just seeing where things are kind of falling apart and what are the levels at which people just don't seem to probably understand how it is that uh, uh, storytelling is meant to happen and why certain things are meant to happen uh, a certain type of way. So anyway, I will use All About Eve as kind of an example as uh, how it is that some people's, I guess borderline incompetence is being exposed through the stances that they take with all about if but uh, I'll basically just be talking about storytelling in general in this video so anyway um, one sometimes hears uh, well I mean you dear viewer may or may not know that uh, uh, when all about Eve was uh, uh, when it had premiered and it was uh, in contention with uh, the Academy Awards in uh, whatever year it was released, was it 1950 or 1951, uh, some year like that, uh, there was a situation that both Anne Baxter and Betty Davis were, uh, you know, in contention for best leading actress that year and whenever there are situations that uh, uh, there are two actors from the same movie it's from a competition standpoint it's a pretty bad thing because they both steal steal votes from one another and they can create the kind of situation that uh, all of the vote that should be channeled to All About Eve, it gets split two ways and some third party comes and wins. Now, I can't remember personally who happened to win Best Actress the year that All About Eve uh, uh, premiered. But basically, there should have never been a situation like that because it was just kind of a, if you will, an abuse of power and sheer egotism on Betty Davis' part to even try to pass herself as a co-lead because from a dramaturgical standpoint the Betty Davis character in All About Eve is nothing but a supporting character. Uh, I would sort of question the idea whether it's even theoretically possible to have a co-lead. Now, uh, some movies like uh, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, uh, those movies, you basically have to accept that they have co-leads because uh, neither character is really effectively more important than the other. So that, that there are some uh, co-lead stories, but uh, those stories basically are pretty shallow uh, pieces of writing. Now, not to speak dismissively about that particular western, but uh, uh, basically 
in certain kind of action, adventure, or comedy movies, you can get away with uh, the kind of uh, more dramaturgically flimsy type of writing because the audience isn't expecting any kind of uh, uh, Dostoevskian experiences. But basically, uh, you know, only bad writing effectively allows for a co-lead type situation. That's just kind of my working uh, feeling towards it. But um, but basically, uh, there should have never been a situation where anyone even entertains the idea that Betty Davis could be a co-lead in All About Eve, which is a movie that has a very simple, uh, straightforward and classical uh, protagonist in the Eve character and with nothing but supportive, uh, supporting actors, supporting actor performance around it. But because in classical Hollywood, uh, they just uh, didn't have the kind of respect for smaller parts. There was basically this kind of idea that uh, if you were a star, you needed to play the lead. And uh, apparently you need to interpret dramaturgy incorrectly if a star should be cast in something other than, you know the actual lead role. But uh, anyway, so the, the kind of politics of art that uh, forced some people to humor Betty Davis and call her a co-lead, that's one thing. But people with no personal involvement in All About Eve, either the production or the film studio or, or Hollywood as an industry, like... Some people who still claim that there's an argument to be made that Betty Davis, that some people not only would make an argument that she would be a co-lead, but they would even make an argument that she would be the real lead. I mean, that is an absolutely absurd stance. And it's an absolutely absurd stance that just reflects how it is that some people just basically know nothing about classical dramaturgy because it's just objectively true that the dramaturgy in All About Eve is built for just one protagonist and that protagonist is Eve. The movie is called All About Eve and this should be such an open and shut case but apparently it isn't and because apparently it isn't I have subject for this video and uh, perhaps it's um, all working out <laughs> in the end. But um, anyway, so uh, let's get to the point. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, because I need to do this video, apparently, because some people don't entirely understand the three act structure, uh, I think it's, um, well, um, I mean, I don't really think that Shakespeare has anything to do with it. But the fact that Shakespeare has five act plays, uh, I think potentially has helped to contribute the kind of culture of uh, having kind of a, you know, just giving kind of a cursory glance at uh, the idea of that there would be acts that stories are consisting of because in some earlier eras of theater uh, even when there was um, uh, not necessarily very classically competent storytelling uh, there had to be activision because uh, uh, well you needed intermissions for for starters in that uh, because uh, from a logistical standpoint, uh, you couldn't always have a continual flow of storytelling. So that uh, uh, Activision uh, just existed uh, uh, for the sake of convenience for the people who were staging something. In, uh, you know, classical French or classical Greek... Uh, tradition of theater, you'd basically have a single setting per act. 
so that uh, if you wanted to change setting, you wouldn't do it mid-act the way that Shakespeare does in his plays, but that uh, you basically, you know, just bring the curtain down and then as the curtain sometimes, uh, you know, just metaphorically spoken, like Greek amphitheaters obviously wouldn't have like an actual curtain, but like um, uh, as the as the troop kind of ceremoniously bows, bows out of the piece, you could sort of get the audience to reset uh, that some such and such thing might happen in a different place and that that would be fine. Uh, but uh, anyway, in Elizabethan theater, obviously they didn't keep the three-act structure or, well, ostensibly they didn't keep the three-act structure, let's say. And uh, they didn't give the kind of single setting act structure. And uh, so Shakespeare has five act plays effectively because there's like uh, mini intermissions between the act. And I would make the argument that uh, that kind of uh, act division is just over logistics in that uh, it's just kind of punctuating the proceedings and that there's zero intellectual reasons between... Uh, you know, moving from Shakespeare and one act to the second act to the third to the fourth to the fifth, like, uh, and sometimes they have prologues or epilogues, but that, you know, there isn't any kind of uh, greater rhyme or reason why Shakespeare has five acts. That, uh, that's just, that's just a silly convention. And uh, perhaps some people think that uh, the classical three-act structure would be another silly convention in that, uh, uh, cinema doesn't really need that kind of, uh, that kind of a logistical uh, reasoning. You know, a, a movie is that kind of a continual flow story that uh, some earlier eras of theater couldn't uh, arrange because of, uh, you know, realities around the materia uh, that uh, the story uses for decor, etc. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, or unfortunately, well, it just so happens, I meant to say, it just so happens that the classical three-act structure actually has nothing but uh, an intellectual reason behind uh, why it is that um, it is constructed as it is. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, one could make the argument that uh, storytelling has the same kind of uh, base, uh, same kind of baseline as linguistic has, uh, in that uh, you cannot really have a sentence in any language without it being built around a subject. So there's something. There's something there, something being described by the sentence. The whole raison d'etre of a sentence is to describe something. So, uh, the sentence begins with a subject at its heart. And then this, uh, you need a subject and you need a predicate uh, to... Uh, you know, if a sentence is something described... Subject is the something and predicate is described. So if you say that it's a beautiful day, uh, you know, the, the subject is day and then the verb is uh, to be and then, uh, you know, to be beautiful is kind of the, uh, the description. But uh, basically in... In the simplest terms, linguistic is uh, the description of something where the description orbits around the subject. And uh, you could say that storytelling follows the same main, you know, baseline reality. In that uh, 99% of all stories, and certainly all classically competent stories, have this kind of idea that main 
the main character, the protagonist, is the gravitational center of that kind of universe that the story is set in. The protagonist in the subject is the most important thing in classical storytelling. And then, uh, what, then the, the story proper is like the predicate in that the, uh, the, the activity that is happening in the world is orbiting the main character. You know, in a movie like Star Wars, when they are at the mo what is it called? Something like Mos Eisley Cantina or something. The story follows the Luke Skywalker. Now there's more people in the bar. If it was like a Robert Altman movie, conceivably the camera could just leave the Skywalker party and go follow some other individuals. And then basically Luke Skywalker would cease to be the main character, would cease to be the gravitational center of the universe, and the film would just randomly follow whoever and then just uh, uh, be some sort of a, I don't know, intergalactic city symphony or something. But like uh, it would abandon uh, the basic dramaturgy conventions, but it doesn't. And that's why, uh, you know, uh, whatever is happening in the world... Uh, how it is that in classical storytelling, people want to discover it is uh, the activity effectively orbiting at the gravitational center of the main character. And uh, basically, uh, you know, if, uh, if you look at the three-act storytelling through this kind of subject-predicate situation, uh, everything starts making sense from an intellectual standpoint what once everyone accepts that the main character actually is more important than the story. That you cannot have the story happen... You cannot have the story happen in a classically competent manner without the main character being more important than the story, without the subject being more important than the predicate, as it were. Now, People will say in linguistics that the predicate is the most important part of the word, but, well, this is my explanation of classical dramaturgy, and I'm making the sense that apparently uh, we're making a slight departure from linguistics in that I'm saying that the main character is certainly more important than the story as such. Uh, because I think that the story is subservient to the main character in intellectual, classically competent storytelling. Uh, the story is subservient to the main character. The main character cannot be subservient to the storytelling. Although sometimes it might seem like it is, but I'm trying to make this video why it isn't. Uh, so, basically the idea that if in Shakespearean five-act storytelling, the five-acts don't mean anything, like... Uh, it's, it's just a silly convention, but in three-act storytelling, each act means something, and even Shakespearean five-acts have... A, there's a secret three-act storytelling to the Shakespearean five-acts, and basically, if you have a classically competent story, you cannot skip having the three-acts. Basically, if you have a protagonist and the story is set right, it will have three-acts regardless. And basically the three acts in this kind of protagonist-centered dramaturgy is that the first act establishes the world. Uh, you know, like you can describe the three acts as the beginning, the middle and the end. But that's kind of like a conventional... Uh, that's just, that doesn't really open up. The conversation. It's just a conventional way of looking at it. The deeper, more intellectual way of looking at the three acts is that the first act establishes the character, establishes the story. So that uh, you need the, the social plane of the world. Uh, you need a multitude of points, the central most point to be significant. So that uh, uh, you... Uh, you need more than one character in the story to 
somehow create importance to the main character. You you need to take some time just uh, you know slowly establishing situations in the first act to create uh, the scale of significance to the storytelling. So. The first act, whether you are conscious of it or not, is uh, establishing the world and the main character and giving potential to emotional weight to what will transpire gradually in the story. So the first act is all about establishing everything. Then the second act is the introduction of the conflict. So that uh, the first act gives you a status quo, and then the second act uh, destabilizes that world. So that if in Star Wars the first act is that uh, Luke is uh, a faintly romantically inclined young man living on a farm and dreaming of being anywhere else, doing greater things as young people sometimes do, uh, so the status quo is uh, a farm boy wanting to escape uh, and then second act comes to destabilize that Luke as a farm boy reality in that Luke's world in Star Wars A New Hope is turned completely upside down. He doesn't understand his new place in the world as he's thrust headlong in the conflict where he's completely... Uh, outmatched and he's just fighting to escape, fighting to survive. Uh, and basically uh, the second act in storytelling is seeing how it is that our protagonist changes with the conflict. Now uh, in a movie like Star Wars, uh, the reason why we can say that the protagonist is more important than the story is that the Empire was there as a presence in the world. Uh, even when, uh, like, uh, the Empire was a presence in the world, but we didn't look at them the same way until we had the Luke Skywalker uh, base reality established. Now, uh, Star Wars does uh, slightly break from this because technically the first uh, scene establishes the empire, which I would just call establishing the world. But uh, uh, just saying that uh, in this way of introducing emotional significance to the storytelling, uh, we basically need both sides of the situation. We need a sense of the status quo and a sense of the destabilization to sort of contrast them and to uh, uh, have the smoothest emotional uh, connection with the main character that uh, because we can acclimatize to one way and then the natural shift, uh, our ability to empathize and uh, uh, feel the emotion that the main character is feeling comes from this kind of a uh, uh, pretty uh, basic way of dividing uh, the storytelling beats. So uh, anyway, the first act being all about establishing various things so that the emotional payoff can be arranged later. Uh, the second act is the uh, the conflict. How does that the uh, how does that the conflict changes the world and how does that the conflict changes the main character? For instance, Luke is this kind of a heroically naive and clueless young man. And then uh, the conflict enters, the conflict leaves him, uh, shall we say, shaken, not stirred. Uh, and uh, because of that, uh, Luke, the second act, as it's happening, the real point of the second act is the change in Luke. Everyone can look at the change in the world, but really we don't see change in the world as much as we just see us being at different locations. But the emotional anchor to the second act 
is that Luke changes from that kind of a naive, clueless young man to a person who acclimatizes to the conflict. Uh, and then, you know, the second act is all about the conflict to the main character, and the third act is resolution to the conflict. So that the uh, first act is, is the status quo, second act is the destabilization, and the third act is that how did the main character uh, reply to the destabilization? Uh, if we are talking about the Franz Kafka uh, story, like the trial, the main character's reply to the conflict was one of hopelessness and despair. And that's why it's seen as having a, an unhappy ending. Uh, or a downer ending, whatever you want to call it. But in Franz Kafka, the resolution to the conflict uh, is one type of resolution, and in a story of heroism such as Star Wars, the resolution of the conflict is one of triumphing over the conflict. So that uh, this first act is what the character used to be, the second act is the change imposed on the character, and the third act is the new version of the main character. How does the change affected him or her? But in Star Wars, obviously, in Luke's case, him. Uh, you know, what the main character grew up into. So that, uh, you know, people view storytelling frequently as what is happening in the world. In that in Star Wars, uh, the Empire is sort of uh, throwing their way, weight around in the world of, in, in the universe of Star Wars. But uh, the real story of Star Wars is how it is that Luke Skywalker, uh, how it is that he changed after the conflict came to him. So that's how we see that in, in classical storytelling, it's all about the protagonist. The other stuff is just orbiting around the protagonist. There's a bunch of moving parts. It's not that other characters don't matter, but the deep intellectual, uh, you know, cause and effect to classical dramaturgy is uh, us as viewers. Uh, classical dramaturgy takes the twists and turns that it does so that we could have a, a maximal facility empathizing with how another human being goes through these kinds of emotions. So that one, we could understand the emotional path, uh, and then two, so that we could have the emotional path ourselves. Uh, now, uh, different people can have different opinions, uh, you know, whether you want to have the emotional path in a Franz Kafka novel, or whether you want to have the emotional path in a Star Wars uh, movie. Uh, different people can have different opinions about it, but the raison d'etre of the classically competent storytelling is to provide the uh, ability to have uh, a smoothly functional, non-short-circuiting path through the story. Uh, and then if we move to All About Eve, uh, and uh, if we're looking at uh, why it is that the Betty Davis character absolutely cannot be the main character in All About Eve, is that uh, uh, the Betty Davis character is an establishing piece of the world, in that uh, there is... Uh, uh, all About Eve is, uh, for the lack of a better word, uh, all about the old order. And that uh, the secret story to All About Eve is uh, how it is that uh, the kind of world order in the story came to be. Uh, so that uh, uh, Betty Davis is an emotional anchor to the kind of... Uh, world order in, uh, I mean, all about the, it's, it's about uh, the world of the theater, obviously, uh, you know, well, 
at least I and quite a lot of people sort of read it as a Hollywood telling a story about Hollywood so that you just replace theater for Hollywood. But since it's, you know, technically about theater, let's just say that it's about the world of the theater, Betty Davis character anchors that reality. But uh, basically, when we look at Betty Davis in the first act, she's the emotional anchor. When we look at, Be uh, she, well, I mean, she's the, I mean, yes, um, I mean, I want to phrase it very carefully in that uh, Betty Davis is the emotional character of the, the emotional anchor of the status quo. We are able to understand whatever we understand about the world when the Betty Davis character acts the way that she does in her natural habitat. But the problem why Betty Davis cannot be the main character is that she's, uh, she's an uh, anchor to the old world order, the status quo in the first act, in the second act, and in the third act. If we're looking at Star Wars, that the secret story to Star Wars is the change imposed on Luke Skywalker. There is no change imposed on Betty Davis in All About the Eva. She's the same in the beginning, the middle, and the end. Because the person who changes in All About Eva, uh, I mean, first, it's the Anne Baxter character. She's one type of presence in the beginning, a different kind of presence in the middle, and a different kind of presence yet still in the third act. So she's the one who has the character arc that is kind of the secret story, the story within a story, if you will, uh, to classical dramaturgy. And because the, the Anne Baxter character, the you know actual protagonist, because she's the one who changes, uh, she forces us uh, to reflect on our assumptions about the world uh, and we are consequently potentially changing as we are looking at the emotional path of the Anne Baxter character. Now obviously from this point onward I need to, I mean in case the spoiler warning is necessary, I'll go over the plot points of All About the so make of that what you will. And then use your own discretion uh, in case you haven't seen that movie. I wouldn't uh, speculate whether my viewers have or haven't. It's it's meant to be a big classic, classic. But then again, some people just haven't watched. But uh, anyway, uh, the story of all about Eve is that uh, Betty Davis is basically the queen bee in the kind of microcosm of the world of theater. She's the big star, but she's a big star who's getting old. And uh, she, uh, she has to, for the first time in a long time, she has to sort of fight for her dominance in the spotlight. So uh, basically, uh, this kind of central conflict uh, to All About Eve, that's uh, immediately, intro uh, although no, uh, the conflict isn't immediately introduced. So that uh, the, the conflict is actually kind of lurking in the shadows and that uh, uh, it's only after a while in the story that uh, uh, we become apparent to it. The initial conflict is that uh, uh, Anne Baxter is the outsider and some people, such as, such as uh, the Thelma Ritter character, if I remember cor correctly, uh, some people... Uh, become suspicious of the outsider because she's not one of us, quote unquote. Uh, they wonder whether it's wise to let her in or not. Uh, the initial conflict is uh, the seemingly good natured Eve character against those who are suspicious of her, and then the conflict keeps shifting throughout, uh, throughout the story. Uh, now, I suppose it's, it theoretically constitutes as a plot twist, and it's actually, I've never really thought about it before, but the dramaturgy is very deftly handled in All About Eva, in that the, the film manages to very smoothly keep shifting the conflict in kind of a masterclass manner, really, 
that uh, uh, I don't feel like people give the movie its due entirely and that the screenplay is rather first rate in how it's constructed and that the first conflict in All About Eve is uh, uh, the suspicious insiders versus the outsider and then the conflict moves as the audience is allowed in uh, and realizes that uh, the Anne Baxter character actually is a very duplicitous, two-faced personality. Uh, and basically the central conflict is Betty Davis is the old star uh, and there's a new challenger in the Anne Baxter character who tries to become the, the new queen bee who would just sort of elbow out the Betty Davis character into retirement or some such. And then as the audience is sort of allowed in to the Anne Baxter character's schemes for taking over the Betty Davis character's turf, as it were, uh, uh, the, the conflict becomes this kind of uh, will she get away with or not. Uh, but then the conflict shifts again uh, in that uh, as Anne Baxter has successfully become an insider, uh, she basically gets, first she gets caught in her own uh, web of schemes and basically that kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, house of cards that she's trying to build uh, with her uh, flawless uh, way of acting to people, that sort of starts crumbling down. But I think that that's sort of done in kind of a, you know, uh, moralizing manner that's indicative of uh, how 50s Hollywood had to go about things. But, uh, you know, the the secret conflict to the, the third act of All About Eve is that after Anne Baxter had become... Uh, uh, an insider through her schemes that were mostly successful, although ultimately kind of halfway, uh, you know, exposed uh, and uh, slightly rebuffed. But anyway, after Anne Baxter had become an insider, uh, the third conflict, the kind of the gut punch conflict to All About Eve, is her questioning, was it worthwhile? And uh, what people actually don't seem to really make a point about in All About Eve is that uh, Anna Baxter actually, um, she was perfectly successful in that she had managed to become the new queen bee that replaced Betty Davis. But uh, she also effectively replaced herself in that uh, if, if there was a queen bee in the center of the spotlight of that kind of microcosm of society, and she had become a scheming presence around the queen, uh, she had replaced others as scheming presences towards her. Uh, and basically, uh, uh, the kind of uh, seek, uh, yet another secret story to all about Eve, is this kind of idea of questioning what actually is the worth uh, in uh, being allowed to be uh, the kind of queen bee in the spotlight? What is actually the worth of fame and that kind of artistic success? In that, uh, in Michael Powell's and Emmerich Pressburger's uh, The Red Shoes, when the Anton Walbrook character asks uh, Moira Shear, uh, why does she need to dance? Because uh, The Red Shoes is a movie made for romantic reasons. Uh, the Morosia character uh, replies, why do you need to dance? Is that, uh, why do you need to breathe? You know, why do you need to leave? It just means everything to her. And uh, uh, Red Shoes being a romantic movie, it has this kind of very Sturm und Drang uh, flow to the story. Uh, the Red Shoes ending might be a gut punch as well, but it's a very straightforward gut punch. Uh, 
if I may use such an expression, where it's all about Eve, it's kind of a, it's kind of a more elaborate, uh, kind of a sneaker gut punch in that uh, Red Shoes and All About Eve basically uh, have a, uh, a woman in the arts, kind of, uh, she was undone by her dreams. Like, uh, she basically achieved success, but the success was her downfall. Uh, they have the same ending, but uh, there's this kind of a sneakier way that All About Eve uh, goes about the business. Uh, and basically, like, the starting point to All About Eve, it's as if it's so, like, it's kind of this full romantic way that the Anne Baxter character very well could ask if somebody, like, could answer if somebody asked her, why, why do you need to act? And she might say, why do you need to breathe? Uh, I mean, surely acting is, like, surely it's obvious why acting is everything to her. But, uh, basically, uh, the film allows her to have the ultimate success that she feels like having and then dares ask the question, is it actually worth anything? And the character might sort of be forced to think that, uh, you know, to, to borrow two Shakespeare lines from King Lear, one, all that glitters is not gold, uh, very f famous line, and then an another line from King Lear, uh, also late in the play that uh, uh, we will all laugh at the gilded butterflies. Basically, uh, the idea is that uh, if you if you would gild a butterfly, the wings would be so heavy that they re they couldn't really fly. So that uh, uh, you know they have this kind of uh, blinged out coating to them but that, that they are essentially a prisoner of that kind of a hollow success. And, uh, you know, Anne Baxter, uh, she, because she wants it both, that, that uh, her dreams are, like, I suppose this is kind of reading into it, but I will permit myself to do so because I think that the story kind of, implies like that might just well be the case that uh, let's say for the sake of argument that uh, she wants both to be able to fly i.e. certain kind of artistic situation that uh, kind of a sensuous thrill of an artist being allowed to be an artist to do whatever art it is that they are doing so that that wants to fly but also wants the kind of yielding of success and then basically after the Anne Baxter character becomes a gilded butterfly, she basically pre becomes a prisoner of the gilding, a prisoner of the success, and basically that uh, uh, that hollows out the triumph and then uh, leaves this kind of a mildly Kafkaesque conflict, actually, of uh, wondering just to what an extent it was worth her while to have done what she did. Like... Uh, Obviously, she wouldn't want to be an obscurity, so presumably she would take the kind of Puric victory, but, you know, it, it, it's like, a, it, it's almost insolent uh, just to what an extent the film kind of uh, rubs it in, uh, you know, the Eve character's uh, face that uh, just how basically, well, base the victory that she attained was. Uh, and so, anyway, uh, basically what I'm saying is that if you listen to me describe all about Eve, I didn't need to mention Betty Davis that many times, because Anne Baxter is the clear protagonist. Everything that makes all about Eve what it is, like a uh, you know, it's not that Betty Davis doesn't have any function in the story. She has a great function, but it's just... Uh, Betty Davis is basically, like, uh, her character is being juxtaposed uh, against the Anne Baxter character. But uh, basically, I think that all of this stuff is kind of ultimately a bit of a red herring. 
in that uh, 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 basically Betty Davis is effectively just um, part of the world being described. Everything except the protagonist has kind of decor-like presence. In that none of the other characters have any fundamental changes because, uh, you know, they're just there as something extra gravitating around the main character. Like, uh, uh, at, at first, uh, when we're juxtaposing the Anne Baxter character, the Betty Davis character, we think that the, uh, there's some mild novelty that they're different. Then we're questioning, are they different? Uh, then we uh, are coming to the conclusion that they are different if the audience is uh, having some negative opinions about the Anne Baxter character occasion, having negative feelings about the Billy Davis character. But then ultimately the juxtaposition basically just puts them, you know, just being kind of tweedledum and tweedledee. And the story is this kind of... Uh, uh, a strange kind of a figure eight where uh, uh, we're arriving at the starting point but kind of one level higher but also kind of like this upside down uh, way of looking at it. Uh, but uh, but yeah, basically um, with this kind of uh, uh, lens of uh, classical dramaturgy, uh, there just shouldn't be any room for the debate about whether uh, there could be any um, any co-lead uh, status to something like all about Eve, in that uh, it it really is all about um, all about the the emotional roller coaster that. Uh, we as the audience are going through as we are witnessing the emotional roller coaster that Anne Baxter character uh, is is going through. Um, and um, and yeah, um, I don't know. Hopefully, I was able to um, you know successfully suggest uh, the kind of um, proper rhyme and reason uh, between. Uh, the different levels in classical dramaturgy in that, uh, you know, in Shakespeare play, I don't know what the fourth act is. Like, you know, it's... It's just <laughs> something between a third act and a fifth act. But in classical uh, dramaturgy, uh, the, the three acts, they all have very clear, specific, functional uh, presences, and uh, hopefully I was able to uh, display them in this video. But um, anyway, I think that's about it for this video. Thank you everyone for watching, and uh, if you like this video, I hope you'll consider liking some of the earlier videos that are on this channel. But anyway, so for now, bye bye.